welcome back. And one equation modeling. So we've previously looked at all our algebraic models and all our equations. And algebraic models were wonderful. They ran fast, but they don't always give the best results. And immediately when Johnson and King, you know, put out their half equation or single differential equation model, uh, they had tons of improvement for flows that really mattered, like transonic flows and flows with adverse pressure gradients and even separation. And you might imagine if we just keep adding in more fidelity and making less assumptions, then I guess in principle we should have better predictions, but at the cost of greater computational expense, right? Well, we'll see when, as we go along and get to RST models, that's not always the case because um, there's very difficult closure problems that people struggle with today, and they're more computationally expensive. So one equation models um, mean what? That we have like a Rans-based or Favre-based set of equations, and we want to close those equations. And we want to do that by having a single partial differential equation. So it's not an ODE, that would be a half equation model. And uh, so we would try and seek another differential equation. And most of these one equation models you'll see contain one based on like the turbulent kinetic energy, which we'll show in these four pages. And that's what most models are based on. And the original one written by Prantl in 1945, which isn't really used today and turned out to be a little bit impractical computationally relative to other ones, um, is the most popular type of model. And we'll look at um, some of those in uh, the week after spring break. So I think just sitting here, I'd say we would probably want to look at Prannell's model, the Baldwin-Barf model, which we'll look at results in Mentor's paper today and then talk about after Prannell's model, and the third one equation model, which is like in all CFD codes today and is heavily developed and used, um, that came out of the Boeing company, is Spillart's model. And so Spillart is a very famous uh, person today, internationally known, and we'll look at his formulations. And it's uh, a little different than uh, the models uh, we'll look at based on K equation. So anyway, um, let's look at that. So one equation models, some introduction. Really, these came into popularity in the 1960s and even through today, one equation models because of basically advances in digital computers and more memory, more computational power, and before that, it was very difficult to evaluate anything more than the standard equations. We talked about complete and incomplete models before, I think, and I'm not an expert on one equation models by any means, but I think they're generally seen as incomplete. And an incomplete turbulence model means what? That you need to specify something about the solution before you run your solver. Right, so incomplete might be like a zero equation model. You're specifying like something about the um, eddy viscosity as a function of distance to the wall. And you'll see all these one equation models, somewhere in them, they always have some little hidden detail that makes them incomplete. And that's really unlike two equation models, um, which are seen as complete. So generally there's our incomplete because we specify something about the solution. And also these models in general use the Buzanesque eddy viscosity assumption. And uh, we're going to try and look and derive this turbulent kinetic energy equation in a little bit simplified form um, today. And then we're going to introduce the one equation models, uh, which use the eddy viscosity. And we'll try and look at some examples, like in Mentor's paper today. And um, we'll go from there. And so we really want to focus on this turbulence energy equation try and form that extra PDE, which we can use along with closure coefficients and a bit of empirical formulations to close the model. And it turned out that in 1945, Prantl, and of course I should probably spell his name wrong, 
1945, created the first type of model and um, for one equation. And in there, he postulated that the eddy mixing viscosity uh, go, goes, excuse me, velocity goes as partial u, partial y. And um, he chose a turbulent kinetic energy or a specific turbulent kinetic energy per unit mass, which is K, which is the trace of the Reynolds stress right here. So that's the normal definition. This is it expanded out. And this could be uh, something like a velocity scale, where I because this is meters squared per second squared. If you take the square root, you get meters per second. So this could be used as a velocity scale. And you'll see in uh, two equation models, they might find the velocity uh, in length scales by using k and epsilon, which is um, why two equation models might be close. But we still have to specify some sort of length scale or k. k might come out of the equations, but then we're left with trying to specify some length scale. So how do we look for some particular length scale? Um, well, we might just say, uh, Eddie viscosities go as some constant times k to the one half over l. Uh, so that's one way to do it. You have to specify one and the other because one will be found through the equations. So if we if we have an equation for k, then we have to specify l, or you can have one equation model for l and then find k through something. But that's a lot harder. So usually we specify l and then see k. And so the question arises: How do we find turbulent kinetic energy? Well, let's look at the Reynolds stress and say the trace of it, or the Reynolds stress tensor, that's ui prime ui prime bar. And that's, of course, equal to negative 2 times the turbulent, specific turbulent kinetic energy, k. So that's the relation between turbulent Reynolds stress and k. And we would need that into an equation. Well, remember, we had the, um, the Reynolds stress equation. So technically, we could take the trace of that we can take the trace of the Reynolds stress tensor and we find its proportional turbulent kinetic energy of fluctuation per unit mass. And technically, this is really the specific turbulent kinetic energy, meaning it's per unit mass, right? And that's nice, especially when we're dealing with compressible flows. Um, but people formally just called the turbulent kinetic energy. And that should be a informally, excuse me. So way back, equation 1.37 was uh, way, 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 way back in your notes. That's the uh, Reynolds stress tensor and equation. And uh, we can look at that and see that equation is uh, for k, which is a PDE, by its trace of u11, or excuse me, i1122 and 33 in that tensor. So if you take that trace, you can find equation 5.4. And I believe we've done that in a chapter one, two. So this is our kind of our base equation. And it has a lot of physical meaning, which is nice when you're trying to do turbulence modeling. So remember this first term, what is this called? This is called the um, uh, substantial derivative of K. So it's a transport equation. And the right hand side might be seen as sources or sinks. This is a production term. This is your dissipation term, epsilon, right here, dissipation per unit mass. And then we have these three other terms in the brackets. Uh, this is molecular diffusion, this term here. This term here is a triple correlation, which is turbulent transport. And the last equation is your pressure diffusion. And we've I believe made notes about these when we were taking the um, work. Now, in this equation, your dissipation of turbulent, specific turbulent kinetic energy is not exactly 
equal to the real definition of dissipation. And we're going to look at that in a second and what that means. So in this equation, it turns out that it's a viscosity times partial ui prime partial xk and partial ui prime partial xk bar. And uh, Wilcox, in his work, he says that the dissipation is the rate at which turbulent kinetic energy, K, is converted into thermal internal energy, which is equal to the mean rate at which work is done by the fluctuating part of the strain against the fluctuation of the viscous stresses. That's DC Wilcox. He kind of came up with some of the first, not the first, but some of the first K omega models, which we'll mention when we talk about two equation models. So let's make some notes about these terms. There's the substantial derivative k, which is the left-hand side, and that gives the rate of change of k following a fluid particle. That's the first term. The first term on the right-hand side, this is production. And that's the rate at which turbulent kinetic energy is transferred from the mean flow to the turbulence. Okay. And it can be rewritten ta ij times uh, sij. Okay, then there's this first viscous term, right? Molecular diffusion term that represents the diffusion of turbulence. And it's energy through a molecular diffusion process. Then there's the triple correlation, and uh, that's the turbulent transport. It's right here. And that's the rate at which turbulent energy is transported through the fluid by turbulent fluctuations. term, which is the P prime U prime term, right? And that's the pressure diffusion running out of room. And that's just uh, another form of turbulent transport. And we're going to lump it in. You'll see in a second. And there's the dissipation equation. So it turns out this dissipation equation here in 5.5 is a little bit different than a formal definition. Formal definition is right down here, and we'll call that as epsilon true, and it goes as 2 nu times SIK, SIK prime prime bar. Here's the definition of S for fluctuating quantity. Now, for incompressible flows, that's reduced to equation 5.5. 7 can be slightly rewritten, and you can relate uh, dissipation from this simplified TKE equation into one that's uh, the difference between the two. So we can actually look for an error in the RAND's derivation compared to formal definition of epsilon or the dissipation. So it turns out, thankfully, that it's a very, very small error. And uh, you'll see that uh, there's been different studies. In fact, one only about 30 years ago in 1993 by Bradshaw and Perot for these lower speed incompressible flows. 
it's about a 2% max difference for a wide range of turbulent flows. It could be shear layers, boundary layers, wakes, things like this. And uh, so you gotta say to yourself, well, is that an engineering error? Maybe it's such a small error overall that other errors in my modeling and numerics would overcome it anyway, so I may not care. Um, so their study was done to try and assess the error built into the derivation. So I think that's something people generally have to live with. Um, a few other points about these equations. Uh, here we go. We'll see that the un unsteady term in convection are exact, while there's some unknown or non-exact things in the production dissipation and turbulent transport. Okay, so we still have an unclosed set of equations. So to close, we need to, to close, we must specify at least ta ij, which is uh, right here, first term. Um, the dissipation term What else? The turbulent transport. And uh, the pressure diffusion. Mainly because they have these correlations and they represent like unknown variables. So we have to relate them to something we know. And this is done pretty in a pretty standard way by Prantl and his early followers. So what does this mean? This is really like term by term modeling. That's the, we call this type of approach in modeling. It's pretty much done through all these range closures. And uh, the problem with it is that these closures are not going to be any better than the data in which they're based upon experimentally or the particular analytical solutions for closure coefficients. And we'll try and do this to make our predictions as accurate as possible. That's how we're measuring success because there's no other ways to measure it. So let's look at a few of these terms to try and simplify uh, equation 5.4 into something that can be used to create most of the one equation models. So for one equation models, I already noted we're going to assume the Buzanesque approximation will be valid. And we can try and write um, our Reynolds stress tensor this way. We'll say it's 2 times an eddy viscosity, the Sij minus two-thirds of K of delta IJ. So K is turbulent kinetic energy and delta IJ is the Kronecker delta function. So remember if I equals J, it's one. If I is not equal to J, it's zero. So really that means that your on diagonal terms of this tensor have negative two-thirds K and the off diagonal ones don't. So um, you'll see that the second term on this right hand side of 5.8 gives us, if you evaluate it with this model, a proper trace of ta ij, that we should get basically um, turbulent kinetic energy by taking the trace and we recover that. Now it turns out that um, for incompressible flows, uh, SII is zero and therefore Ta I, I equals negative 2k, if you do the math, according to our equation 5.3. So that's one good thing. So that's part of the reason this model is justified. And uh, beyond that, there's no other real approximation. It's a good model as long as you believe that your edge viscosity is scalar, which is a research topic in itself. It could be, you know, if we're imposing some imaginary viscosity to mimic 
a turbulent flow, which is like in a different state of the fluid, why would it have to be sort of an isotropic or scalar type quantity? Why couldn't it be a tensor in itself? So you can imagine people have also explored the idea of having turbulence models where your eddy viscosity is more than just a single positive constant. That, would, that wouldn't be strange at all, and people have explored that, but that's usually results in way more complicated formulations. The biggest problem we have with one equation models, besides uh, now that we handled epsilon, is these two terms, the pressure diffusion term and the turbulent transport term, which are the triple correlation, this double correlation between pressure and velocity. So how do we handle that? Well, that's where a bit more hand waving is involved. And you'll see that it's very standard to represent these two quantities um, with an analogy. And the analogy is the molecular transport process. So if you have, say, uj prime and phi of C, phi sum variable for diffusion, you would model it perhaps as eddy viscosity times the derivative of phi with respect to x. Um, that might be for the pressure, excuse me, the um, triple correlation turbulent transport. There's no analogy like that for the pressure diffusion term. So, and there's not really any great experimental data for triple correlations of velocity. And uh, it's also kind of hard to find experimentally pressure velocity correlations. So people try and group these two terms. And this was tried and it works really well for many flows, but it's an assumption. Another assumption. And how would that look? That would look um, sort of like uh, this equation here, where we take these two terms, the triple correlation and the pressure velocity correlation, and we'll model it as a negative of eddy viscosity divided by a coefficient, which is a closure coefficient, times a derivative of k in these spatial directions partial k, partial xj. So you see, here's this analogy. And I wish I had my little tools back so I can make it orange. Okay, cool, right there. Oh, that's this equation, excuse me. So they're just gonna lump them to and write them this way. So, uh, This is some DNS results. Uh, you can find these correlations. So we didn't have DNS way back in 1945 or even through the 60s. It was high Reynolds number enough to do, you know, homogeneous uh, flows, isotropic flows, boundary layers, things like that. But today, you know, DNS and uh, computers have increased speed enough where I can store U, V, and W and pressure within my whole field, and I can actually find these correlations numerically. I can also independently run my RANS models and evaluate the right-hand side. So in some studies, again, by uh, a few different people at Stanford, uh, Moyne's group, so I'll, I'll write his investors, Mansour, Kim, and Moyne. They were aware of this modeling issue. In 1988, they, they published a really important paper where they did exactly what I was talking about, of directly evaluating the left-hand side of DNS and then they compared it to models on the right and found it's actually a really good model. And it turns out that for a lot of boundary layer flows, even in adverse pressure gradients that are incompressible to high Reynolds number, this coefficient is very close to a constant. And uh, so that's a good closure. And it was a choice that was sort of made 
intuitively and based on dimensional analysis way back in the time of Ludwig Prandtl. And so you think about it, about 40 to 50 years later, and even today, people are doing DNS to explore these closures. And they're doing it with machine learning. Uh, so we can take the databases of LES and DNS, use machine learning to try and find closure coefficients or maybe better approximations for the triple and pressure velocity correlations. So that's another key thing. And there's one more. I talked about the dissipation. And uh, there's this formal model for dissipation. Uh, there's the uh, definition and the one that came out of um, the trace of the Reynolds stress equation, equation 5.5. So you see that's nu times this uh, correlation. So we don't really know this. We know what nu is, right? That's a viscosity. But what is this term? That's just like basically an unknown variable. So that should be modeled too. Well, that's the last closure. And based on dimensional analysis, this is a very straightforward form, and one I used in graduate school a lot, is k to 3 halves over L. That's turbulent kinetic energy to the 3 halves power divided by a length scale. And you can check the dimensions to make sure they're balanced. They are. And if you want, it's like meters per second to the 3 halves all over meters, right? units of dimension. So that's just a simple dimensional model for epsilon. And you'll see that's actually used in a lot of the two equation models. The nice thing about that is uh, now we don't have to worry about modeling that correlation and dissipation directly. And it works really well. So we have a differential equation for k. And you see now that there's this thing L, we don't have another PDE for it. If we created a PDE for, say, length scale or dissipation, then it would be a two equation model. But then I have to pay way more money to run my computers and way more time. I don't want to do that. I want a one equation model. So I got to specify something about L still in the codes. And that's where a lot of the choices come in. There's, like you saw in our algebraic models for um, boundary layers. Multiple people have specified link scale multiple ways, and a lot of these models came to be the inner and outer layer models. Well, uh, we don't um, have to do that as much anymore, and we'll, part of these closures we're going to look at is how to, how to specify L in a closure. Well, anyway, if we take equation 5.4 and 5.9, let's go back and look at those. So 5.9 is my triple and pressure velocity correlation, and 5.4 should be my... K, equ oh, yep, K equation, if we take those, combine them, and all this other little assumptions, we're going to get equation 5.11. And it turns out that most all very popular one equation models use this equation. And it's really simple. You have the left-hand side which looks a lot like the left-hand side of my other equations and my RANS equations, and we're tracking turbulent kinetic energy. It's a PDE, um, and I have a simple model for dissipation here. Oh, dear. And uh, my production term. And the hardest part, all this has been lumped together, and now we have a viscosity plus an eddy viscosity divided by that coefficient with K. So you see, I know everything in here but L, which is an epsilon. And so that's a big choice. And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to create good models for this. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about a few different one equation models.